Welcome back to another edition of the European Tour Picks and Bets Mayo Media Network. My name is Skylar Hoke. Tom Jacobs, how you doing? I'm good. Uh, obviously, just as happy as you are that we're uh, on to a third week now where we're hoping we can uh, get the winner in. Um, John Catlin followed by Derek Higo. Um, if it's Higo, I'll be surprised. I actually think it's Higo, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go with Higo. Um, what a role, hey? Uh, unbelievable. I mean, you know, betting golf as long as we have, hitting a winner is is special. Hitting it back to back weeks um, on the tour that we just beloved is just you know quite an experience. So to have that with the launch of this show, it's you know really exciting for for what we put our blood, sweat, and tears into. And the kid played excellent. Twenty one years old, five professional wins to his name already two of them on the European tour. Um, and this was a big time one, you know, the field was stronger than what he played in Portugal when he won. And he was just excellent all week long, you know, found himself unbelievable, of course, on the greens, just, you know, we saw it all weekend long, hit so many putts, but he put himself in position, was aggressive off the tee. He sprays it quite a bit and still was able to, to manage it with the irons and take it deep on what we expected that course to play like. Um, and, Again, he's probably somebody we'll talk into at the top of the, the odds leaderboard uh, for this week. Max Kiefer wanted to play the role again of stealing it from us for the for the back-to-back weeks, but um, ultimately was able to come out on top. So, you know, shout out to everyone who also backed Higo with us. Um, exciting week. So, yeah, it was just a, a really good uh, viewing experience. Of course, when you have somebody who's kind of that runaway, um, it's just a lot of fun to enjoy and sit back and watch. There was a point earlier on in the round with a par five where he kind of chipped in off the back of the green, and uh, he kind of knew it was going to be his day then. And and you know there is also there's always an element of luck I think when you win because I think but I think you also create your own luck. And he never really put himself in any difficult situations, did he? He was just consistently low every day. Um, and and that's uh, we talk about you know you mentioned a stronger field, and and people still don't give it much credit because of the the type of event it was. But to go that deep, that, that that many rounds in a row against a storm in Maximilian Kiefer, okay, he's not a winner on the European Tour, but he's he's well known. He's uh, he's been around for a while and knows how to put the pressure on, you know. And he didn't falter at any point, really. Um, you know, he's, once the guys around him weren't really putting a shift in, Matthew Pavon, thank you very much. Um, you know, it, it kind of, I think that. I think that helped him the fact that he didn't really have so much pressure on him, but kind of soon was there, you know. There was guys there that could have really made a run at him, and he just didn't didn't seem to uh, be pressured by it. And I think they mentioned it in commentary when you're 21 years of age and you've already won as many times as he has across the tour. I suppose why would you go? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, as easy of a 63 you could have had on Sunday, that's honestly what he had. You know, yeah. it was it shouldn't. I mean, you stress in the position having the outright tickets. You know, it feels like man, it's it's within two now, and it's within. You know, it's like oh. Is it really going to happen? You feel that pressure, but it, it never really was. And, and you know, that was uh, just fun to watch and excited for him, you know, to now get into another major championship. Uh, another by saying Catlin getting into his first and then Higo going to get into his first the PGA championship. You know, big opportunities for them. I think Higo could potentially, you know, kind of fit Kiowa in an interesting sense too. So excited uh, for those guys. But let's dig into this week. So we're staying on the islands here in Spain, the Canary Islands. We're going to be going over to the Tenerife Open, which is the Gulf Costa. Oh man, I don't even want to say the last one. Uh, a DJ. Uh, that's probably GT. Yeah, something like that. Okay. I mean, look, I, I'm I'm from closer than you are in Iceland. <laughs> so you know let's just let's just roll with it true i go to your pronunciations and it's it's no better on some of them but um yes championship course here it's gonna be a par 71 right about 6800 yards but what's intriguing about this course six par threes five par fives last time it was seen what well, i believe 2003 records were shattered on low scores um you know the winner was like 23 under on some of these longer holes i mean it, it is something where i think overall we're going to see the the mid 20s maybe even someone pushing 30 under for a a victory here which in some weeks i don't really like it but on the european tour i feel like it, it just brings out the best in some of these golfers and we ultimately you're going to hit it close and it's going to be who runs hot with the putter you know as hago did last week as Kiefer did for the stretch however you know i think there are some interesting elements to think about when going into the course what are you looking at tom so for me i kind of 
the last week I had very much the, the Iman Open and Mauritius Open, things like at Saudi. And I didn't really get a kind of feel for a, a particular course comp this time. I think it's just very much the same as last week. I think if you look at last week, you look at uh, Africa, the hills for the Cyprus Open, I just think it's very much resorts like the, the first event in Dubai before Christmas. Anywhere where low scoring happens, I think it's good. Portugal Open, you know, these guys are just, I think what you saw last week is going to translate very well. We've seen two events in Kenya, we've seen two events in Wales last year. I think it's going to be too insightful. I think it's going to be like that, but just obviously not the same course. And, well, it will be next week, but yep. it, it's just weird to me. I just think that it's just going to be, it's just guys that are suited to low scoring, which seems obvious. Um, and I, I think that does rule a certain that plays out, which is which is a shame during the time it's in the field. Yep. Uh, and I agree. And with thinking it, you know, just from a, a overarching perspective, you know, again, there are, I, I actually, this is pretty interesting because um, we, again, we're, we're so deep in the trenches with a lot of this data. For those that might not know, you know, a lot of this strokes gain statistics, par three, four, five, birdies are better. All of these stats are available on the European Tour website. So I'd recommend if you are, again, one of the first time viewers or or those that are now getting into the European Tour, take the time to kind of dive in and get to know some of these players because you know, again, we've looked at this, this stuff and know the, the back ends of these golfers pretty well by now, but I, I had multiple people ask, you know, you know, how's a player hitting it? How are you seeing Guido missing these putts? There is shot tracker available on bet three, six, five each week. Um, so again, first time viewers, feel free to reach out and ask some of these questions because we're happy to point you in the right directions to be able to start learning more about these golfers that we love. Um, and with that, I think let's just get in the top of the board. Um, you know, we see Rosner up there in the 14, 16 range, Matthias Schwab, uh, Garrick Higo coming back there, uh, for a second week in a row now sub twenties. Um, and then it kind of jumps up a little bit to, to Houston and JB Hansen in the 20, 20 mid twenties range. Um, any of those guys, uh, reach out to you even into the thirties or anybody you start in your card with there. Well, so, so JB Hansen kind of appealed to me, but I couldn't quite get there. I think he's a guy that he's hot and cold it's hard to really rely on but i think that he has got a great chance of going back to back really i don't i don't really see apart from the price he's obviously a bit off putting because as you mentioned on our, on our podcast earlier is is that the, these winners don't generally come from the top they tend to come from 30s 50s I don't, you don't get these bomb long shots win all the time with their hundreds 150 etc but you do seem to get a lot of mid-range guys 40 50 really take the mantle and we, we've seen it with Schwab last week, we've seen it with Rosner, you know, their talent is so good that they, they walk into a top 15, top 20 finish, but they need to really be on it to, to pay back the value that they are. Um, and, and there's so many guys that we, we're going to talk about in a minute, go from 33 to 150 to 1 onwards, that just, to me, just makes so much more appeal. Yep. And, and again, you can bet two of those golfers or three of the long shots for the price of one Garrett Higo this week. And, and, you know, from an allocation standpoint, I think that makes a lot of sense when we get into the variance of what the European tour brings week in and week out. Would I be surprised if Higo's mid twenties again, pushing it? No, it should be similar in the sense that, you know, this course is going to, you know, be shorter, be attacked on par fives. If you think about the approach play, it's going to come into there. It's going to be second shots on the par fives and it's going to be into these par threes. It's it's going to be wedges into those. You know, you're going to have either those that are really long distance or the shorter, you know, iron. So I think, you know, to me, I, I, I heard does have, you know, we saw him hit some, some bombs of 380 um, on Sunday when it mattered the most, you know, dead center, which, you know, takes some nuts to be able to, to do that. So that's why I say like at some of these bigger tracks, Kiowa in specific, I think his game can translate, but let's uh, let, let him celebrate a little bit this week and give another victory to potentially, uh, you know, the bet of the week the bet of the year, the bet of, uh, every single podcast for us. And it's where I, I start my, my card. And for those that aren't familiar, I'm going to ask you first, we're going to do our plug, please rate review, subscribe to us here for the European tour picks and bets. Uh, we appreciate all the listeners, you know, Pat and Jeff have been pointing everyone kind of in our direction recently. Um, so please do that because we love the feedback and we love Guido Migliazzi. Our favorite Italian golfer in the world is trending up 
you know, he continues each week to really, you know, put a low one out there. I kind of did the research and looking back, if you saw how he played on, it was Friday and Saturday last week, ball striking like a maniac, getting himself in the mix. You saw those being top five rounds of the day. He also at the Magical Kenya Open had a top three round of the day. He had a 65 and 67 when he was there. In Qatar, he had a 67 and a 65 there as well. Both of them were rounds of the day. In Saudi, he had a pair of 67s, one of those being the top five rounds. And in Dubai, he had a 67, which was a top three round of that day. Every time Guido makes the cut, he is going to put a low one out there, if not two. If the kid can string together four of them in a row, he is going to boat race a field. I really think he has it in them. His putter is coming along. Sunday, he didn't make anything tonight with him four back thinking, man, Guido can really win this thing. And surprisingly, they opened with him at 40 to one. So um, DraftKings offered that earlier. Um, so I, I hopped immediately on that. That to me is, is screaming value for the trending golfer, not only just somebody that I adore, but it seems that, you know, the, the, the statistics and everything we're looking at is par threes. You know, he just led the field in that two weeks ago, his approach numbers, Guido makes so much sense. So let's light the world on fire Guido this week and, and come home with a victory. I think the, the best thing about Guido is like you say, he's always got the potential to go lower and he's, and he's a streaky passer, right? He's not the most solid passer. He's not the guy that you can kind of rely on every week, but you know when he's hitting the ball well, he will take advantage. He will just get into a zone and he'll go for it. Um, we spoke about it on the podcast just before that he doesn't seem to start very fast. He's kind of always fighting his way back into the event, and then coming up slightly short. It's always well, what have you done on the first uh, Thursday or Friday, you know? And and that will change. It a hundred percent will change. He's already won twice on the door, um, you know. So it's it's just a matter of time before he just hits Thursday's going again. It might just be he's struggling to get up for it week to week it might just be you know the venues are still new to him quite a lot of the time new to everyone this week um so yeah i think i think he's absolutely fine i went for another guy um at, at a different end of the scale in terms of experience in, in thorpe john Onison, who is a guy that we haven't seen a lot of for, for different reasons over the last couple of years um we hadn't seen him for, for well any of 2021 really um and then he just comes late last week and shot a 61 in the second round. And he, and he followed up with a 17. It was disappointing and it put him out of the race. But for me, he's just, you know, he's a five time winner on the European tour. He's contended in major championships at the Masters of the Open, WGCs. He, in terms of class, he is right at the top of the field. Um, and if that 61 last week is a point to anything, then uh, Thorby Onelson should be at the top of many people's list, I think. Yeah, right in that nappy factor as well. April, they brought a child in the world and, um, you know, just seemed, again, one round away from, from being right there. Um, to your point, I mean, what his his WGC performance, last time Hideki Matsuyama had his victory, Olison was there um, that week, and I'll remember that fondly. So, yeah, his game uh, is probably, to your point, class of this field. Um, when it comes to betting the the come ups or these golfers still trying to have their first breakthroughs, there's a pair of Americans that stick out to me in this mid range. Um, the first one being a golfer who his finishes are incredibly underwhelming to what his game really is. You know, if you have a golfer who consistently is gaining a stroke per round on ball striking, if not higher. Um, you know, over a extended course of time, that golfer you'd, you'd project to be one of the best on tour. And the fact that Sean Crocker hasn't broke through, you know, one T2 finish, you know, in the latter half of, of 2020, a top 10 at the Scottish championship prior to that. But, um, you know, he's just mediocre finish after mediocre finish. And this type of course where he can really open it up. He can, of course, use his his strength off the tee. He's one of the longer guys on the European tour. Couple that with the fact that he is really good on par fives. We have five of them this week. And that his irons are just 
prolific. He's the only golfer in the field that from last five tournaments to the whole year long time span is hitting those key benchmarks at top of the field. So to me, I really, really want Crocker just to break through. And Sam Horsfield said it on Instagram today that his buddy is with Sean Crocker, but he is the best ball striker on the European tour. So I'm ready for him to break through. And then the second one is a golfer who also fits some of those trends, a golfer who um, to the sense of what we just mentioned to a, a really good off par five score, really good with some distance, good with the irons, solid on par threes and par fives. Yet he comes off of two missed cuts, which is a little bit miffed and probably why you get the number of Johannes Veerman at 55 to one. I mean, if you look into Veerman, you know, he hadn't missed two cuts in a row since 2019. So that is quite some time for him to kind of be in a, a mini funk in a sense but you're getting up, you're, you're, quack, you're, you're hopping on like a, a, probably a little, you know, puddle jumper to, to head over to the other part of the Island, or you're driving across to get to this course. And these guys are there for the three weeks they're strapped in, you know, I don't think there's any sort of layoff or any worry of a miscut for me or me for Veerman. He is, you know, obviously he had multiple top 20 finishes just before this 54 hole mix in Kenya, not too long ago. Uh, I just think he can really string it together and prevent some present some value relative to the mini bump in the road that he's faced. Yeah, and I think for, for both guys, I think that the, the important thing is about Sean Crocker there is his results don't show what he is, and, and it's very easy to give up on him, right? But the reason that he never misses cuts, he misses probably one or two, you know, over the last six or eight months, his, his irons are so reliable, and that's the only part of the game that's really something you can build a foundation and you know around the green is going to be course dependent putting is going to be week to week dependent um driving you know you can have a couple of skewed holes if your irons are the biggest kind of indicator of your form is how we kind of go week to week we look at strokes gain approach and he's always there him kurt kitayama veerman's there often maverick Hankcliffe, people like that are just always there um and and we use it and we and we see a guy get a bump and we come to a couple in a minute in recent weeks, we tend to go there. And Crocker's just there all the time. And your question is, well, what does he do wrong? Well, he doesn't putt right. Um, so, you know, it, it's just one of those things. It, he's going to figure it out. He's too good of a player not to. He will win on European Tour. And I guess that he's probably got a game that would trend to the PGA Tour as well. We'll find out with Horsfield this week in the Valspite. It'd be a similar sort of trajectory, I'd have thought. Um, and then Veerman, you know, we saw how well he played in Cyprus on the resort golf course. Like we said earlier, he didn't actually win the showdown, but he won by the aggregate score over the four rounds. Um, and yeah, I just think they're both great for, for resort golf courses. And, and I think that he needs it a bit tougher, um, Crocker, in the sense that I think that's when his lines will come to the fore. But I refuse to actually downplay any of your picks after you pick the winner for the last two weeks. So I'm just going to say, yes, they're great. And let's carry on. You're too kind, Tom. You are way too kind because the one golfer I did leave off in this range, you can't bet them all. You know, you, you get six, maybe seven shots at it. That's what I've been taking recently. Um, you know, especially if we're, we're not starting our cards to the back end, we can load it up a little bit on these long shots. But <clears throat> this golfer, you know, outside of one hole Sunday, and if you watch this one hole on Sunday, this actually worried me as a Higo backer because that hole honestly took 30 to 45 minutes. I swear when Connor seem hit it left, I think like 13 or 14, man, that felt like an eternity. And unfortunately it resulted in a quadruple bogey, but you know, his other 71 holes was littered with birdies. And the fact that he opened at his odds, um, I think that's pretty intriguing. So, so sell me on why, you know, you're on Connor this week. I just think that there's, there's so much potential. We, we, we compared it to kind of Hill last week in the podcast that, the price disparity between the two, the two very not just Scottish and, and that way, but they're both in terms of form, in terms of win equity, in terms of uh, style of game, they're both very similar. Callum's won three times and Jeremy's won both the one we've kind of seen, but they've both got the same sort of profile and structure in careers. And and I think we've kind of seen is just overlooked. I think people have given up on him because he's been in the mix of a couple of times and, and ultimately failed. He's 25 years of age. You can't not everyone's a Garrett Higo that goes and plays, wins five times before they're 21 years of age. It's, it, it, that's a rarity. You see guys don't win for the first time until they're 30, 35. 
36 foot, you know, whatever it is. You talk about people like Jimmy Walker and a PJ Tour, how long did it take him and then he became a major champion? I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying he's going to do that, but can he win on a resort golf course after playing so well last week, barring one hole? Um, yes, he's a birdie maker. He's one of the most consistent birdie makers on the on the, on the the European Tour. Plays par threes and par fives pretty well. And he's going to need to do both this week. Um, and he, he generally plays well, you know, He's sometimes quite volatile, and I think that's why the price is built in. But look, he was top five last week. I don't see why he would be 55, 60s, and 66 one bigger than something that should be right in his wheelhouse. Yeah, I mean, for those that have continued to watch the European Tour, us investing money on Sean Crocker and Connor Seam, if it was a 54-hole tournament, these guys might be the odds-on favorites. One of these Sundays is going to turn for them eventually, and they're going to break through at some pretty good prices. And again, the European tour is littered with those type of guys um, that sometimes feel like, you know, when the going gets tough at the top of the leaderboard, who wants to step through? Higgle did make it look easy, you know, last week, but even how he played, I mean, I guess he played exceptional on Saturday too and, and lucked out, but the leader is not getting beyond 18 under or only him being the only one to get past 16 under. If he would have faltered on Sunday, a lot of guys were in that mix. You know, you would have got down to Guido, if not below, if someone put up a 62, 63 and Hago would have, you know, stayed neutral there. That thing was wide open in some senses. So I think that's, you know, the standard on the European tour each week. Um, we have a, a couple long shots. I kind of grouped this trio together, but two of them that we go in on. Um, and I'd like you to let's uh, let's start with hmm, which, let's go with the the Italian that we've backed uh, now two weeks in a row. Let's go. So it's Nino Patasio. Uh, we talked about there being six par threes on the on the course, and he's right up there in par three scoring. I think he's actually third or fourth in the in the uh, tour, but he. Guys that are above him have played like 50 less par threes. So he's exceptional. Par threes, and, and that's continued on from 2020 as well. So for the past two years, just every time he tees it off on the par three, he expects it to go well. So he's had 24 of those. Hopefully, he makes a cut this week. Um, he's going to have a great chance. He's been in great form. His ball strike, uh, you know, his iron play over the last three events has been absolutely superb. Um, even like when he's finishing tied 38, like he did, he's shooting a 63. He's just capable of shooting such low numbers. His iron is just uh, excellent right now. I think he's first in the field in the strokes kind of approach over the last eight weeks. He's seventh in tee to green over the last eight weeks as well. So there's nothing to suggest that he can't go low in this sort of environment. Yep. I, I couldn't agree more. And the fact, you know, out of outside of a three-hole stretch, I mean, he went five over on three holes on Saturday, you know, mixed in a bogey, triple bogey, bogey. You do that, you are done for here. Yeah. You know, it just, you can't come back from that. I mean, you know, his his finish isn't representative. Of course, you know, you, we say that for for Seam, you know, to, for Nino to do that, finish 38th, you know, not really sniff it. It's why we get triple digits once again. And he, he's averaged for the last four events over two strokes per round ball striking. So off the tee plus approach. You know, no one else in the field is even, you know, sniffing that metric. Um, so I think it's only a matter of time before he he capitalizes it with a short game and gets himself into the mix, which, you know, he has shown some low ones recently. If you're going to continue those irons at some point, it's going to crack and you're going to, you know, make the putts and, and hopefully, you know, you run into a hot one this week and you, you string it together. Yeah. Um, he's got he's at three top 20s in the last five starts. You know, it's not, it's not yeah. to be sniffed at and at the end of the day, like even the tied 38, it looks terrible, but he's got a 63 in there. And it, it is a case of just being able to roll the rock. It is just over, you know, it's not too far away, this golf course, but it's different green surfaces. It's Tiff Eagle rather than Pass Fallon. That might, that one little change may just kick him into gear. You just don't know until he gets there. That's the, that's the difficulty of not knowing the golf course. We don't know what, what he's going to do. But the, the predictive metric that we're talking about in terms of irons suggests that he's going to go well. Yep, I, I agree, and I will continue to to ride with that. I'll go into the next one before I lead you into your last one, um, and it'll be Richard Manzel. So uh, challenge tour, I guess you would say graduate in the sense that, um, you know, there wasn't all that many events for him to play uh, just last year. You know, if you think about 
you know, 10 events collectively for him in 2020. Two of those resulted in second place finishes on the challenge tour. Um, and then he's come out in the European tour, missed those first two cuts in Kenya. And now that he has got eight rounds, you know, in a row under his belt with a T28 and then a T56 led by the irons, you know, and that's what really, to me, sticks out. Somebody who in 2019 uh, was really good on the, it would have been the Euro Pro Tour, winning in 2019 with what, three other second place finishes. Um, you know, he has a knack for the top of the leaderboard in some of these smaller events. And this is the prototypical pathway. I guess not prototypical pathway. It is um, not an abnormal pathway for, for some of these golfers, the Sammy Valamakis, the Matt Wallace's, the Guidos, you know, to win on these lower tours to contend. And then, you know, the moment they're in contention, Derek Higo, you win on the European tour too. You know, it wouldn't be all that out uh, of the world to see guys like that. And you just have to be early enough. And that to me represents what Manziel is. Um, so I think, you know, he's really, really long off the tee too, like the next guy you're going to talk about. Um, so just off the tee, trending irons, deep, long shot, who has been a contention on some smaller tours that hit the board uh, for me at about 150s. Uh, and yeah. then let's hit the next one. Yeah. And just before we move on, you know, Richard Mansell, as well as it, it's got people like Till Hatton, they, they show what they can do at a lower level. They can only win what's put in front of them, right? I mean, Richard Mansell is now getting to play a European tour for the first time in his career consistently. Um, but every level he's been at, he's either won or contended, and that's just a good sign. Uh, the last guy for me, and we agree on him as well, is Nicola Hoygaard, um, the, the other twin, if you like, because Rasmus is obviously a two-time winner on the European Tour. Um, but there wasn't really much between them, and they both came out on the professional ranks. There wasn't this big disparity between uh, talent level. Uh, Nicola was second to Sergio Garcia at the KLM Open, pushed him as far as he could. Um, you know, he's got the pedigree exactly the same as Rasmus had. And I think it's just taken a little bit longer. And Rasmus has now been over in America for the last two weeks. Nikolai has, you know, played really well. He's been really solid in his last two starts. He's been ninth and 17th in strokes going approach, second and seventh in tee to green. Bombs it, you know, makes it some of the birdies when he gets a chance. He's just, he's so volatile that the, even with the form that he's showing, he's going to be a triple digit number. And, and I'm happy just to take advantage of those people. And he is, you know, top five in this field in distance. Obviously, you know, to your point, we know what Rasmus, you know, has done. And we didn't know two years ago when these kids are making their appearance, who was going to be the better of the two. Yeah. And what's to say two years from now, who is going to be the better of the two? It could absolutely flip back um, to that sense. And, you know, trending irons with really good approach play or really good distance off the tee, you know, that that's just a combination that I think is, is going to be well uh, set up to take, you know, a, a really low score at this resort type of course. We, we um, think about Ed, Eduardo Molinari and Francesco Molinari, you know, back in the day, Eduardo came out firing. He was the, he was the better brother. He'd won an awful lot of times. And I know there's a slight age difference, but Francesco has just kicked on and, and surpassed him in so many ways and won major championships. And, and you can't see that. You can't see that five years before it happens. It's, it's, you hope it happens sometimes in certain cases and you think you can predict that something might change, but these guys, I mean, they're both still so young, 20 years of age. It, anything can happen. They're, they've come out, to, they're not even Gary Higo's age. We're talking about him as a young star. You know, it's, it, there's so much time ahead of him and, and he's maybe taking a little bit longer to adjust than Rasmus has and, uh, and we'll just see where the time it takes. Yeah, and again, if we're going to continue on this trend, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, you know, a, another long shot type of golfer, one that, you know, we've talked over the last couple of weeks, trying to dig deep into, you know, the Austin Batistas of the world who worked out the, two weeks ago, the Oscar Sanchez's who didn't work out last week, but was fun, you know, to root on at thousands. Um, if we go into 200 to one, we will find uh, Alejandro Del Rey. So Del Rey has teed it up, um, it, which should be, I think, back-to-back -back weeks now. So we've seen him overall, you know, he is only the, let's see, 21st, 24th in back-to-back -back weeks. So that was Austria and then the Lopesin. Before that, he was playing on the Alps Tour, couple made cuts, Challenge Tour, couple made cuts. 
Alps tour, a couple top five finishes with a win. You know, he only has 17 career starts to his name um, from the OWGR metrics. However, if you looked at his world amateur golf rankings, he reached 32nd in the world, which included multiple wins. Um, some of them being in, you know, B, you know, level amateur events, one at Trinity Forest, a wide open golf course that you can take advantage with off the tee. And that's what he did last week. He was the best in the field at par five scoring. He averaged under four strokes per par five, you know, with his Eagles, he mixed in. Um, and if we have five of those par fives, you know, with his distance, which he also led the field last weekend, you know, we didn't have these numbers for him in Austria. So we didn't really know, you know, from a strokes gained or from what he's did. And he putted well too. Um, and I found this stat very intriguing. He went to Arizona state, um, and he was a, a PAC 12 first team, you know, all conference. Um, but what's pretty intriguing by him is, when we went and looked at the um, Eagles, so if you went to see Arizona State, um, you know, Eagles in their career, of course, the best golfer probably to go through Arizona State, yeah, you're Phil, but if you, you think about the next one, it's, it's John Rahm. John Rahm had 39 career Eagles at Arizona State. Alex Del Rey was second with 26 um, for career Eagles at Arizona State. He showed that last week. He's going to show it again this week. You know, if he's going to keep up with that distance, if he's going to keep up with the putter, he's going to find himself with many Eagle chances all week long, 200 to one, I think is, you know, pretty decent odds to find somebody who again is showing up in the same type of fields, mid twenties appearances, uh, finishes, and, you know, with a little bit of, you know, flair on some of these smaller tours already in his short lived professional career, I am in on him at 200 to one. Yeah, and, and for me as well, what you can forgive him is that he threw three rounds, he was 15, and he had a chance to, to really progress, and he shot a 69 in the final round and, and fell backwards, and that doesn't happen very often. It's just the demands of this goal course, and okay, he didn't have a chance to win, probably not, but when you've got a chance to really have a top 10, top 5 finish and change your, your kind of outlook in your career, um, the pressure gets on, and he's only you know still fairly young. Um, but like you said, he's got everything that kind of suggests he can do it. He's played two events in this year. He's, he's finished top 25 in both. And when you look at the missed cuts he's had on the European Tour previously, there's it, two at Valderrama and the Open Dia Spania as well. So, it, you know, it's just maybe one or two golf courses he doesn't like. He's, he's played two really good weeks. He's still got plenty ahead of him. You've talked about the, the obvious there at the ASU as well. Um, if he's 50% of the goal for the John Ramis, then, uh, then he'll take it. Amen to that. And before we review our cards, want to make sure we shout out, um, if you want to subscribe and enjoy this in an audio format, you can find that on any of the podcast platforms, um, daily fantasy sports picks and bets, the mix. If you just type in the mix, you'll be able to find us anywhere that you would listen to podcasts. So Tom, with that, let's review your card. Yeah. So I'm starting off with Thor Bjorn Olsen. I think he, you know, he's a Last acts, and I think he's uh, showed with a six month last week that he could be back. Um, we're going to go with Connor Seam for my uh, my demons. I think that he could actually break through on Sunday, and hopefully, an easy resort course allows him to do that. We both agree on Nino Batasha and Nicolo Hoygaard. And uh, you, you're talking into Alejandro Del Rey. I think uh, you know he's the, the potential there. I, I couldn't quite get into Austin Sanchez last week, but I can get into Alejandro Del Rey, so uh, I'll join you there as well. Awesome. Um, I'm going to be going with our guy, Guido Migliazzi, 40 to one, please feel free all week long. Tweet at me, the Italian gifts. We want those Guidos. We want the fist pump going. So feel free to tweet those at me. Uh, 40 to one, Sean Crocker, 50 to one, Johanna Severman, 55, Nino Bertazio with you at hundred to one, Nikolai Hoygaard, 125, Richard Manzel, 150, and Alejandro Del Rey at 200 to one wraps up our card for the week. Tom, where can they find you? Yeah, so it's uh, Lost Words podcast on all your platforms and Tom Jacobs 93 on Twitter as well. And uh, if you keep winning and I can just still be here every week, then, uh, you know, my followers are going to go up. So that's all great. 
Amen. Let's keep it going. You can find me at Skyhook DFS. Um, I run a podcast each week with my co-part Axis, um, Brian DeCordy. Um, you can find him. And also he loves the Guido gifts too. Feel free to fire those at him as he's been riding the, the bandwagon together. Um, but then yeah, feel free again, continue to follow us, ask us questions. You know, we're, we're loving the community support. Uh, and really, you know, this has been a fun ride and we hope to continue with this week. So best of luck, everybody. And thank you again.